is up, everybody? Welcome into episode 15 of Chris and Company. I am Chris Castellani. I like keeping these interviews a secret now and then just kind of, you know, dropping a bomb, so to speak, on my audience because I'm really excited about the interview that we have today. We will be joined by Tigers reliever, reliever, not closer. Uh, out of respect to AJ Hinch, I'm just going to say reliever. Uh, Jason Foley will be joining the program. This has been uh, probably a long time coming. Jason's always been a uh, nice guy, really supportive guy, easy guy to root for. I wrote, uh, back when I was with my former employer, uh, I wrote a blog, a positive blog, uh, about Jason Foley, at which point he actually reached out to me uh, on social media thanking me for writing that. So that was uh, obviously very kind of him to do. He did not have to do that. And so uh, we've been following each other on social media for a minute. I asked him to come on Chris and company. He was gracious to come on the program. So I'm looking forward to you guys watching and or listening to that uh, here on this beautiful, what, what day is it? Thursday uh, morning by the time this is uploaded or whatever time you're choosing to listen to this. It really doesn't matter. But before we get to the interview, a couple things that I want to uh, knock out here. First off, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Let's get those watch hours up. Click that that bell, that little bell. That way you are notified every time that I upload a video to the beautiful site that is YouTube. If you want to find Chris and Company on other platforms and audio formats, you can go to Apple Podcasts. You can go to Spotify. You can go to Google Play. Find all the fixings there. Shout out to Austin who continues to work his butt off setting all these things up so you can listen to Chris and Company in audio format. Also, I'll say this is going to be making something of a comeback here. Um, by the time you're watching this, a video could already be uploaded, but keep an eye out on that. Those will basically just be kind of editorials of me talking about whatever the hell I want to do, but with the, uh, with, with the added boost of Austin's production to really help me out. Hopefully that can grow as well. And also earlier this week, we uploaded our uh, opening day at Comerica vlog. Austin did an unbelievable job, uh, putting all the fixings on that. Really proud of what we did. We're going to get back to Comerica at some point soon. And while it might not be trivia necessarily, we're going to create, some content there. I, I just, I assess and self-assess more than anybody watching that back. I seemed about as comfortable as you're going to see me. I'm always going to have some natural anxiety, but I felt pretty good while doing those. And Tigers obviously won. So you can look forward to more content. A lot of it will primarily be found here on YouTube. But of course, you can find me on Twitter at Castellani2014. The link to all my social media accounts is in the description for this video. There you'll find the link tree to Everything Chris Castellani related that your heart so desires. All right. I think that's it for the self-glossing and self-promotion. Very excited to get to an interview with Tigers reliever Jason Foley. Let's do it. All right, Chris and Company, episode 15. Got another Tiger on the program today. A guy currently rocking a uh, 0, 0.0 ERA. So that's you're off to a good start. If I jinx you for your next outing, I apologize, Jason. But uh, hopefully not. Uh, guy who's been uh, electric so far for the Tigers coming in, pitching late relief. Got a big save just a few days ago against the Pittsburgh Pirates in that wild ninth inning comeback. Jason Foley joins the program. Jason, what's up, man? How's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Of course. No, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, you've been one of the more requested guests uh, recently on uh, Chris and Company, which is no surprise. Like You've pitched incredibly well. You pitched great last season. You're off to a great start so far in 2024. But I want to I want to dive a little bit into your your past here, because I think that, you know, we've interviewed some guys like Scooble and, and Justin Henry Malloy, who've been, you know, on prospect lists and talked about as, as you know, future MLB players, or in the case of Scooble, somebody who's already, you know, peaked uh, or made it at the big league level. But someone like you, your ascension was, you know, it's a pretty remarkable story. You come, you went to Sacred Heart for college, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw a little bit of Sacred Heart uh, uh, trivia your way. Do you know how many Sacred Heart players uh, made it to the big, big leagues, including you? I think three. Um, yes. Yeah, it's my, my good buddy, Zach Short, who obviously was on our team last year. And then uh, Troy Scribner, who I missed by one year. He had a cup of coffee, I think, with, with L.A. Yeah, good pull, man. Well, that was going to be the next part of my question is that you and Zach Short played together in uh, college. So you were on uh, – this was during COVID. You were in the Tigers organization when he got traded. Uh, we traded Cameron Maben for him. Uh, did you reach out to him? Were you excited about the prospect of potentially being on the same major league team together? 
Yeah, it was nuts. I mean, we're we're really tight friends, so so we pretty much talk every day. And then uh, I think I was at the alternate site, and he, he texted our group chat and was like, "Yo, you're never gonna believe what what just happened." And we we're like, "What?" And he's like, "I just got traded to the Tigers." And I was, and we were kind of just like, "Yeah, I kind of think you're messing with us." Like, no shot. And then like, lo and behold, you check Twitter, and then boom, it's like Cameron Maven for Zach Short, and I was like, "God damn!" Like, what are the odds? Is there any part of you that wish that you could have faced him when he was uh, when you guys were playing the Mets a, few, uh, a week back? Yeah, um, I do. But at the moment, my professional career against him, he's over two with a punchy. So I, I do have a pretty sparkling uh, record against him head to head. But it would have been pretty sweet to face him. He did come in and pitch run in the ninth inning, which was kind of weird. I like looked over and I was like, oh shit, there you are. Um, <laughs> like try not to steal off me and, and ruin this this chance here but uh it was pretty cool to be on the other side of him as well for sure yeah and, and it, like i said you know your your ascension was pretty was pretty remarkable you know in the 40 round draft in 2016 you were uh you weren't drafted uh what was kind of where was your mindset at after finding that out and what was kind of the next step that you were going to take in your professional career at that point yeah um yeah 40 rounds so uh it's 1200 times we got skipped on but um uh, it was obviously upsetting. Like Zach got drafted that same year, um, and I was obviously pumped for him. And like, but it was kind of tough at the same time because all of our friends and coaches and and guys we knew were like so sick. You got drafted, and I was kind of like I felt like a little left in the dust. But um, I it took you know I got over it, and I was just like whatever, so be it. I'll go back to school. I'll play another year with like my like my best friends uh, I met at Sacred Hearts. So I was like fuck it, I'll go back to school and get ready to play my senior year and see what happens then. And then. Uh, just went to summer ball like normal, like any ordinary summer, and then started pitching really well and got, you know, got got a chance to sign. And I was like, might as well do it. Did Did you expect to get drafted? Were you surprised when you weren't? Um, no, I, I didn't deserve to. Um, you know, Sacred Heart, obviously not a, you know, not like a powerhouse baseball conference, like a low D one conference. We didn't, you know, there's there's a very select few people that get drafted out of that conference. Um, like Karnacek was at James Karnacek from the Guardians. He was in that conference as well. But you know, I didn't I didn't throw really well, so I, I shouldn't have gotten drafted. I mean, my my agent or advisor at the time would obviously it's kind of like hyping you up and like, oh, you're going to be fine, you're going to be fine. But that's just kind of their job. So I, I was like blindly optimistic, but I think deep down I knew I kind of wasn't going to get drafted. And you you started at Sacred Heart, right? Yeah, I was a starter. I mean, uh, again, like kind of at that school, like not not a terrific talent pool at those type of schools so like anyone who's half decent uh is gonna start just to eat the most innings possible um i started out as a bullpen guy my freshman year started throwing pretty well my first few outings and it slowly built up from like one inning outings to like two or three and then it was just like you want to start and i was like yeah sure like obviously did it in high school like anyone really did but um but yeah i was a starter and then i'd always go to, to summer ball and be a relief pitcher just because you know, they wanted to like save my innings and stuff and, and whatnot. And I felt like that bullpen switch was uh, just a little better suited for me and my mentality. And, and it helped me, uh, I think, you know, obviously get to this level. Yeah. And that was going to be my next question. Short, shortly after that draft, was that around the time when you kind of committed to the idea of being a reliever long term and kind of left the idea of being a starter in the dust? Yeah, like again. So every every summer, I'd go play summer ball, be, be a bullpen pitcher, and, and I'd always have like a little bit of a velo jump, a little bit of a velo spike. My stuff seemed to be a, a touch better. Felt like I was just a little more comfortable in that role. The kind of like, you know, like the starter. It's like the whole day. You get like the pre-start anxiety. You're you're ready to go. You're thinking about your outing. You're mentally, you know, you're st you're stressing about your outing, going five six innings. And like the bullpen, I felt like a little bit, just a little more comfortable down there kind of just you get ready like go in a short spurt and you're ready to rock and like I also felt like my stuff was a little better I, I felt like I was able to let let the fastball eat a little more kind of throw without any any like constrictions and any like oh I got to save myself for the fifth or the sixth inning and whatnot um, and I kind of just fit my I feel like personality and what as a pitcher again it, it just I had I had much more success in that role and it seemed like you know just based on what I was reading like you were kind of getting you know, a lot of confidence and you were building your stuff up and you got your velocity up and then another roadblock gets in the way you get Tommy John in, I believe 2017. So like another roadblock for you just to kind of, you know, another hurdle for you to get over. If you could just kind of talk me through 
well, first off, how that came to be, how you realized that you, you know, you were going to need surgery. Was it in outing where, uh, you know, you felt some, where something was torn or was it kind of a long-term process? Like what Mize had to do with? Uh, no, mine was pretty, pretty, uh, I knew it right away. Like, I, so yeah, 2017 was my first, my first professional season. Um, I was signed at 16 in the summer. So 17, my first professional season and, you know, I was kind of just on the, you know, I was about as bottom of the totem pole as it gets. I was an undrafted free agent and I, I kind of scraped my way to starting in West Michigan, which at the time was low A, which is now swapped. Um, but at the time it was low A, kind of fought myself on that team and then just started throwing the ball really, really well. I got promoted to Lakeland around halfway through the year. And then my like third or fourth outing in Lakeland, we were in Daytona Beach playing the Reds uh, high, high A team. Threw a fastball and kind of just felt this kind of crappy sensation in my elbow, like a, like a pop, a crack kind of sensation, something I never felt before. And I kind of knew right there, um, somehow gutted through the outing. I don't really know how. I actually got a strikeout, which, believe it or not. Um, and then right when I came out, my trainer did a bunch of, like, tests on it, and he kind of was just like, all right, we're going to get an MRI tomorrow. And, and by the, the bus trip home, which was, like, two hours, it swelled up so much. And then by the morning when I woke up, it was literally, like, you know, my range of motion was like, it couldn't even straighten or couldn't go back. And I mean, I still was like, oh, maybe it's not, but like I deep down again, I was like, I'm toast. I, I, mean, I know it's like, this is something I never felt before, but, and then get the MRI and then he yeah, obviously had to get to TJ. You know, there's so many hurdles at this point that you, you know, you had to climb, obviously coming back from being an undrafted player to now you're getting Tommy John. I mean, was there ever any consideration at this point of, I mean, it sounds crazy in, in now, you know, considering where you are, but was there ever any consideration of moving on from the game? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, again, it's um, as a guy that like was, uh, was undrafted, obviously just had to like pretty much. I don't want to say like be perfect, but had to have so many stars aligned for me to make it to the MLB. Like I was kind of like, all right, like I was pitching well. I finally kind of cracked a prospect list, sort of had some buzz around my name a little bit. And then it was like, shit, man, I just get funneled right under everyone else and like kind of just scraped to the back. And I was just like, yeah, kind of like, you know, what am I doing here? I mean, I had a good degree. I had an accounting degree. Like I see all my buddies are, are working. I'm from the Northeast. All my buddies are working in New York City, like make, having great jobs, like making a bunch of money. And I'm kind of just like, you know, what what's the point? Like this is such a long shot to begin with. And then you tack on a Tommy John and undrafted, like all this stuff. And, but I don't know. I kind of just gutted through it. Um, I don't really know why I gutted through it, but I was just like, you know, why not? Right. I mean, like, uh, you only have one opportunity. You really only have one opportunity to do this. So, you know, figure, give it one more chance and see what happens. And so at what point, just a timeline wise, were you finally back pitching like consistent uh, innings in professional ball post Tommy John? Yeah. So I got the surgery in like the, I think August of 2017. And I think I could have technically been back for like the back, like the last month of the 18 season, but just because it's, they, they were just kind of like, what's the point? Let's just, mm-hmm you know, drag your TJ out for like another month, make sure it's rehab properly and then just be fresh and ready to go for the 19 season. So I had thrown bullpens up, up at the end of the 18 season, um, was all healthy and then came back and like full ready to go in 2019 and then spent that whole summer in Lakeland in high A. Um, okay. Yeah. Right there. That was, that was, I was going to ask that next. So you started 19 in Lakeland by the end of the 19 season, where were you? Had you made it up to high A at that point or double A? Well, Lakeland was high A. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I spent the whole summer there, which kind of stunk. I mean, uh, like all my buddies, my draft class, they were in double A. And, like, I felt like I was throwing the ball well outside of, like, a couple of, you know, relievers I think get a little bit biased numbers sometimes with, like, a blow-up outing here or there. So I felt like I was throwing the ball well outside of, like, a couple of just fluke outings. Um and I just, they, you know, I didn't get promoted. And, that, and that's one of the harder parts about the minor leagues is, like, you think you deserve to get promoted and, and kind of just staying in the course and staying true to, like, working hard and not, not worrying about whether or not they're going to promote you and whatnot. But I did feel like I should have gotten promoted. But, you know, it is what it is. And, and so then 
you, you go through the 2019 season, you're finally healthy again. And the, I, I've asked Scooble about this. I've asked Mize about this just because I find this period so fascinating in terms of how guys processed it. COVID happens. And the, I feel like COVID, that entire run, that entire year, not just in the way certain guys performed, but in the way that we evaluated players completely changed. I guess where you were at in terms of your development and your kind of personal mindset at the time, how did you experience that? Did you feel good kind of going through it? I mean, it was obviously a drag for everybody, but where, where, where was your head kind of at going into that 2020 season? Yeah, COVID was COVID was a, a weird time because, again, like 2019 was my first year back from Tommy John, which, you know, um, I would I would argue most people that have gotten it would agree. Like, it's, it's you know, it's a little bit of a roller coaster. You're kind of, you know, I haven't pitched competitively in like upwards of a year and you're trying to just figure stuff out again, like, find your mechanics, find your, your pitches, yada, yada, yada. So then I was really pumped for the 2020 season. So I was like, all right, I'm, fr- I'm I pitched a, a good season. Like I'm, I'm ready to go. Now it's like, now it's go time. And prior to that, I had never, I had never thrown in a big league game before. I'd never been invited to big league camp. And in 2020, um, I got my first opportunity to throw in a big league spring training game. And it was against the Yankees in, in Yankee stadium or in Steinbrenner field in Tampa which was pretty sweet for me because I'm, I'm from New York. Most of my family friends are Yankees fans, so they were able to watch it. And I threw really well. I got three ground balls, and I came in, and AJ was just like, like, nice job. Like, I'll see you again soon. And I was like, oh, shit, like, this is awesome. Like, World Series manager, our new manager, like, he's, like, probably going to have me back in town. And I threw another outing also against the Yankees. I remember, like, first pitch ground ball was an error. And then, like, I got out of a nice jam with, like, a man on second, no outs. And he was, like, kind of giving me some kudos again. And I was like, oh, shit, like, this is awesome. Like, I'm kind of, you know, I feel like this is, like, a big turning point in my career. Like, um, I'm obviously not, like, a well-known prospect. So these few outings that I could impress the coaching staff and AJ are going to be important. And I did. And then COVID shut it down kind of right when I felt like I was grooving a little bit and making a little bit of buzz for myself. Um and then it sucked because I didn't, I didn't get invited to, uh, like, the alternate sites or anything. I, I kind of got, like, a pity invite in, like, the last month of the alternate site when I think they just needed, like, some innings to throw in their squads and whatnot. So it, it kind of sucked because I felt like I was really on, like, a, a good track. Um, and then it got shut down, and I, I kind of just didn't really participate in baseball for the rest of the summer. When, when during this whole process, did you start to think that being a major league pitcher was – now realistic yeah probably uh honestly probably that moment that first big league game i threw in because again prior to that i never got invited to camp um and then aj was just like just kind of giving me some hype he was just like hell yeah like we'll bring we'll, we're gonna definitely bring you back like and um obviously as a big league manager and, and one and a guy that's you know that's won a world series i was like all right i mean if he thinks i'm good like obviously i could pitch in this league so uh, that was definitely a, a, a turning point for me. Um, and then one other time, it was uh, it was the 2021 spring. Um, I went to like the AAA. The, I, I skipped over AA, went to AAA. There was like a month of alternate site of AAA while the, before the big league season, season started. Or sorry, as the big league season had started, AAA had gotten delayed a month. And we were just doing like inner squads in Toledo. And I remember Rogers, Jake Rogers had like texted eight, was texting AJ and, and AJ said something to him saying like, just keep an eye out on Foley. Like, let me know how he's doing. Like, we're going to need him or something like that. And I was like, oh shoot, like that's, that's pretty cool. So like, then, then it was like, all right, this is seriously a possibility. I think that's one of the really cool things about AJ as well is that he comes from a scouting background. So the way that he looks at players and evaluates players is probably a little bit different than a lot of other managers, which I think is, is great. Like I think that they've discovered a lot of talent, especially with pitching over the last several years. So you, you made, I think 11 appearances in 2021. I was looking through your, your baseball reference page and your first outing, uh, you hit, you hit two batters. Now credit to you, man, over your last 145, do you know how many you've hit? Uh, I know I hit a guy in Tampa last year. I want to, I want to say one, but I, I could maybe two, but I think I can remember one off the top of my head. It's, it's four total. You probably, probably one or two that were legitimate. Maybe another one that was off the back of a guy's foot or something like that. But yeah. Oh, no, I hit, yeah. I hit Vinny Pasquantino too. So I guess two my opening day and then maybe two after that. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I got four total after that, but still, I mean, that's okay. that one third came in that first outing. Is it, 
fair to say that nerves might have gotten you and that that major league debut or no? Yeah, no. I mean, I think anyone's nuts to say they're not nervous their mm-hmm. their debut. I mean, shit, we get nervous now. I mean, I think I think nerves are kind of a good thing. It shows that you care. But uh, yeah, I mean, I also remember it being absolutely boiling in Chicago. It was June sixth in twenty twenty one, and I I don't know if I just felt hot. Like I don't know if it was the nerves or whatever, but I felt like it was like one hundred and twenty degrees. Um, and yeah, I remember the, my I, was, I think it was my first pitch actually. My I pretty sure it was my first pitch. I hit a guy in the foot with a sinker, and then. I backed up a slider into, I don't even know, maybe Andrew Vaughn's back, um, and then Tim Anderson came up like prime Tim Anderson. Was, right like, when we when we could not get him out. So yeah. Yeah, when he was batting like 450 every year, and then yeah. like there was 40,000 people in Chicago back when they were really good, and I was like, oh Jesus, like this is, this is not the way you want to start your career, huh? But luckily he he lined went out to the first base at like 140 miles an hour, so luckily got caught. But uh, it was you know. Yeah, it was one is wasn't exactly how you want to start it. Hey, it was a scoreless frame though. I mean you That's did true. get you did get through it. You pitched out some trouble. What did um what did AJ and, and Fetter say to you in the dugout after you got you got through with that? Um, I don't even remember. I mean, I, after your debut, everyone's kind of just like, Congrats. It's there's, yeah. there's, there's not a ton of like con- uh, criticism or, or constructive moments after your your debut. It's kind of just like a hey, congrats, you kind of you made a you made it up, which is obviously like an amazing moment. So it was kind of just all like congrats and, and nice job getting out of that. But he did say he was, he was, that was my last batter. So it would have, it would have sucked to get taken out of that game. Um, so I was happy I got out there. For sure. For sure. And, and I think what, one thing that's been really cool about your development is the way that AJ's kind of slowly worked you into bigger and bigger roles. I mean, you pitched a lot of games in 2022 and then last year, pretty early in the campaign, it was obvious that, that you and Lang were getting the high leverage innings you got your first career save against uh against the guardians i think it was the second game of a doubleheader uh last year and what was and I, again thank you for baseball reference it was the shortest tiger game uh since galarraga's perfect game the the jim joyce game in 2010 i was i think it was an hour 55 minutes you know you're you're preparing for an outing like that you know when you got to go through your reps you're throwing your bullpen is it in the back of your head that yeah, this could be this could be a special moment for me? This could be my first career save, or is it is that noise that you try to block out? No, I mean I think it's impossible to not um, to not like recognize what's going on. Like you know <laughs> when you're watching a game and someone's got a few no hit frames or a few perfect frames, and you're kind of like, well, you never know. Um, so I definitely knew I definitely knew what was happening. I mean I remember Erod through like the most he was great eight innings of all time. Yeah, and then. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I think maybe Lang for the first game or something. I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you said you're in the game. And I was like, all right, like ready to rock. Like, this is pretty sweet getting my first opportunity. And, um, you know, I remember it was a one nothing game. And it was like the heart of the earth. I think it was the top. I think it was like 9-1-2. And it was like Miles Straw, 9, and then someone else, and then Jose Ramirez. And I was like, all right, well, one-run game, Miles Straw runs like a deer. So, like, just try to attack the zone and, and you know not not give him a free pass and, and hopefully get get up to Jose Ramirez with with at least no one on base and, and luckily it was a one two three inning and got a couple good plays behind me and uh, it was cool to punch Jose Ramirez to end it because he's a guy that's a pretty pretty tough AB. Yeah, no, I look, I trust you as much as anybody in that pen, but I still hold my breath every time Jose Ramirez comes to the dish against us, man. <laughs> he's been oh, he's been a tiger killer for like set for a long time now. He's had a no, he's had a, one of the more underappreciated players in the league to me too. Like he's borderline hall of fame numbers at this point. I feel like nobody, nobody ever talks about him, but he's had a great, great career, but that's obviously an incredible memory to have, you know, another incredible memory is that you were a key piece of the combined no hitter last year uh, with the game that I, I had the uh, fortune to be at, you know, Manning pitches the first six and two thirds innings. And, you know, he, he pitches great. He gets taken out, you know, the natural instinct by the fans is they kind of, they start booing. They want to see him kind of continue. You're brought into the game. Uh, Manning said after the game, he did not know that he didn't know that this, the, that there was a no, no going on. Did you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, I mean, baseball players are morons. If, if the dude throws <laughs> one, if like, if our starter throws one no hit inning, we're like, all right, no hitter watch, like watch <laughs> out. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But like realistically, after like three or four, we we're like, all right, like he's kind of cruising. Um, I don't know how he didn't realize, but um, yeah, no, he was he was cruising there. It was a we- it was a weird game because you just don't expect uh, you know to come in the game as a relief pitcher once, so long as the starter hasn't given up a hit or a base runner. Um, 
so like we got the call down and it was like fully you start warming up and i was like i was like are you like are you joking like i thought he was, i thought i was kind of getting like messed with and i was like like what you know what are we doing everyone was kind of like oh like what, what's going on here but i was like whatever i gotta start throwing i gotta start warming up and then lo and behold aj comes out takes him out and i come in the game and all the fans are just like you know don't mess it up blah blah blah. he's got a no hitter and i'm like thanks like obviously i'm aware of the situation <laughs> um and I luckily kept it. The hardest part was because I came in with two outs in the seventh, mm -hmm. um, got an out, and then the whole like mid inning, I'm just trying to like not think about the fact that there's a no hitter going on. Um, and then luckily, you know, luckily just happened to keep it keep it going and gave the ball to Lang, and he did his thing too. But it was pretty sweet. Are Are you a big don't talk about it in the moment when it comes to no hitters and perfect games? Are you Are you superstitious like that or not? Oh yeah, the boys the boys never talk about. It. I mean, you gotta you gotta try to avoid it at all costs, but. But we knew it was happening for sure. For sure. No, it's weird because I and usually that's the case. I was just I was stumbling upon some footage where Mark, when, during Mark Burley's perfect game, he said he was just like pacing the dugout, telling guys like, "Man, I got a, I got a perfect game going." Which I feel like that's a small percentage of pitchers. Uh, but 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 that was Burley though. Burley would get the ball, he'd, he'd take five seconds between pitches and throw it. Like he just kind of had that nonchalant um, attitude uh, uh, about him. So yeah, no, you obviously, you, you pitched really well last season. You're off to a great start here in 2024. Now uh, having, maybe it's the new PA system at Comerica that allowed me to notice this, but your, your walk-in music is what is love by Hadaway. Yes. Was that, was that your walk-in music last year too? Oh yeah. All I right. kind of got forced to keep, not forced, but semi forced to keep it. Cause during spring we were doing the, um, like the green screen media day stuff. Mm -hmm. And like they have you do a bunch of you know like stupid gags whatnot for the for the the big screen and then yeah. they had me do like the the head bop thing and I was like you guys kind of you know forced my hand to keep my walk up not that I was gonna change it but uh, so they they had it going for me. What was the inspiration behind choosing that song? I don't know. I kind of just um, I kind of wanted just to keep. I, I, a I like the song. I, I wanted to keep it. I didn't want something too like hype up. Um, too like crazy, get me going. Um, and I thought it was just a cool song. And I thought, I think part of the song is for you. Part of the walk up song is for the fans. And I feel like it's a pretty popular kind of like fun, loving, keep, get the fans going kind of song. So, you know, I made it and I, uh, it feels like it's working. I, I'm pretty sure they put the fans on the, on the big board doing that when mm -hmm. I'm walking in. I, I haven't actually looked because I kind of need to focus on pitching, but uh, yeah. I do think that's what they do. So I guess it's working out. Yeah, no, I, I could see it catching on because it seems like over the last, and it's always been this way going back to like Rivera and everything, but it feels like over the last several years, cl like closer and reliever entrances have become a bigger deal over it. Like since, I feel like since the Timmy Trumpet thing with, with Edwin Diaz, it's like, every, you know, every, every big reliever needs to make sure that they have a, which I mean, it works for Diaz because Diaz is terrifying too. Well, it, it, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, when you're sitting 102 and just strike out every single person, it's pretty sweet, but I got to throw after him. I was warming up both times in New York when he came in and. I mean, it, it's a pretty special walkout. <laughs> yeah. They didn't have any much fans because it was like a doubleheader on a Thursday, but um, it's a pretty spectacular walkout. I, I was obviously, because from my, my previous employer, I know a lot of, of New York people and a lot of Mets people. A lot of people weren't weren't huge on it being used in a tie game, which I'm like, eh, it's, it's his entrance. It doesn't matter when he comes in. It doesn't, yeah, it should, should still be his song. Yeah, um, I would agree. Yeah, uh, you know, I was looking at, at your numbers and, and it seems like pretty much across the board, your numbers since you got to the major leagues have seen just a significant uptick in terms of production uh, than where they were at in the, the when you were coming up through the minor leagues. Outside of you know health and getting your you know your body right, what's been the biggest change for you as a pitcher that you feel like has allowed you to really thrive since getting to the big leagues? Yeah, I would say two things. One, uh, one is a, a little bit. Uh, one is development development of my off speed stuff and a little bit. Um, more consistent off-speed stuff. I felt like coming up through the minors, I was just a hard thrower. I didn't really have much there. Um, then developed the sinker, you know, later in my minor league career, which which obviously helped. It's, you know, my best pitch. But I think developing a little more consistent off-speed pitches, like my slider has gotten, I think, better and better throughout the years. I don't um, – just like my command with it, my ability to throw it for strikes and whatnot. So I think that's been a big help. So I'm not as much of a one-trick pony. And I think just some confidence, like kind of what I was talking about when AJ, about when, when you asked, you know, when do I think it was real? And AJ was like, kind of AJ gave me some kudos. And we've talked about this a bunch with AJ. And I was just, um, it's kind of like, it's hard to have confidence at a level when you haven't succeeded at that level yet. So like you get called up to the big leagues 
obviously, you know, you, you think you belong, you, you earn that call up, but it's like, sometimes it's kind of like, how do I, how can I have confidence in myself to succeed against big league hitters when I haven't yet done it yet? So I think the more I've had success at this level and the more AJ's put me in, you know, more important spots against more premier hitters and tighter ball games, like, and the more I've succeeded in those spots, the more your confidence builds. Um, Cause it sucks, you know, when you come up and you debut, like, you know, you're the up 10, down 10 guy, you're the mop up guy, you're the throw in the fourth when the starter can't get out of the, you know, can't pass the third inning, or you're, you're the throw of the ninth guy when you're down 10 or up 10. And it's hard to throw in those situations. And you kind of know you're in that role for a reason. Uh, and then you kind of start to build your way up and, and, and throw more important situations. And I think that grows, your confidence grows with those outings. Uh, you alluded to something there, but is it mentally easier for you to lock in in high leverage situations than it is in, as you said, kind of mop up duty or those 10 nothing leads or 10 nothing, you know, a deficit? Yeah, it's, it's weird because, right, you throw, like last year, I pretty much threw mostly like the eighth inning before Lang, seventh or eighth inning, you know. Um, and it's, I would say it's harder in the sense that you're throwing in situations where if you don't pitch well, you generally lose the game. And it's harder in the sense that you're throwing in situations where you're facing maybe the heart of the order or they're always pinch hitting a favorable matchup for them. But at the same time, I thought it was easier because I knew I would such as I had my routine was able to be so similar because I knew I was like, all right, I'm going to throw probably the seventh or the eighth inning, probably like down one to up three. And it was a very easy situation to lock in for. Whereas like my first year in 21 and 22, it was like, again, I could throw anywhere from the third to the ninth. I could throw anywhere from up 10 to down 10. If like Joe Jimenez and, and Fulmer were maybe down that day, like I could throw the seventh inning leverage. So like you have to lock in so much more in, in those times. So I think it's easier now to lock in and know when I'm going to throw, but it's harder just given the situation. Yeah, and it's it's a unique thing because I there's a lot of relievers out there, a lot of great closers who always struggled in non-save situations. Like they're just mentally that their their brain chemistry was so prepared for high leverage that it seemed like something just went a little bit screwy when they weren't in high leverage. You know, your sinker has become it was one of the in in terms of pitch data, one of the twenty best pitches in baseball last year. I mean, it's just a ground ball machine. Has that pitch always been a, a weapon in your in your repertoire going back to Sacred Heart? No, it's actually a hilarious story. Um, not really funny, I guess, but in, I think it was uh, it was 2020, um, 2020 spring. I was in minor league camp, and we brought in a driveline rep. I don't know, you know, I'm sure, I'm assuming you know. Yeah, no, I, I've, we talked about it with Tarek. Yeah, I'm. I'm familiar. Okay. Um, anyway, so we brought in a guy from driveline to work with ten of our minor league pitchers, not in big league camp. Uh, he came in for a week. We threw three bullpens with him, all like pitch design, pitch shape oriented. He had like the TrackMan, the Rapsodo, you know, the Edgetronic, all these, all the tech, all the technology. And my whole thing was whether or not he was like, let's see if you want to throw a four seam or a two seam. And I pretty much, I threw two four seams, and right off the bat, like without even looking at the data, he like his eye test was like, yeah, like that pitch, outside velocity, like pretty much sucks, like. Mm. he's like it's flat it's kind of like a dead zone heater is what they call it um and i threw one two seam and right off the bat he was like yeah that like looks way better um so pretty much from then on out i i pretty much was exclusively two seam sinker sinker as, as my fastball and you know I, I i remember when i debuted i emailed the guy's name was spencer i forgot his last name but i emailed him or texted him and i was like dude thank you like i oh so much to so much of this success and the reason why I debuted is because of you but I, I didn't start throwing singers until three four years ago in hindsight do you kind of view that as the beginning of your ascension so to speak because that pitch is I mean that's an unbelievable story Jason because that that pitch when you throw it it feels like something that you've had in your back pocket for so long the idea that it was something that was kind of late in your development is crazy yeah no it's nuts I didn't really yeah like I, I never I felt like the Tigers were, when I came up in 16, were maybe a little bit behind on the analytic, um, you know, department and, and whatnot. And we didn't even know, like, I, like looking back on it, my four seam again. Yeah, like, if I, if I threw it now, it's just a, I still I still use it now, and I, I get a little bit of success with it because I come from a weird slot and, like, a low slot. But before, when I was only throwing four seams, it was just not really a good pitch and it got I got away with it in low A just because it was hard but like the, the more I got up the hitters are just you know hitters can hit velocity if they know it's coming so 
Um, it's crazy to think that I started throwing that three, four years ago, but um, I'm obviously super glad that guy showed, showed me the ropes. Yeah, that's remarkable. And, and you get, obviously, a lot of weak contact with that pitch. But so far in the, you know, we're early in the season, but so far uh, in 2024, your, your strikeout rate is up compared to what it was uh, last season. Do you aspire to be somebody who's missing more bats and getting more strikeouts, or is your number one goal with each outing just like, I, I want to get out? I mean, I think everyone could say, would say they'd like to strike more guys out, uh, me included, um, especially – you know, especially as a, a one inning kind of reliever where like, God forbid you give up, you come in with a man on third, less than two outs. You have a guy, in, you know, it's obviously super important to be able to strike people out. Now at the end of the day, I'll take three outs before a run every single time over a couple strikeouts in a run. But um, I have been, you know, adjusting my approach to left-handed hitters a bit more to get hopefully some more strikeouts. And I've, I've gotten a couple good ones this year against some, some pretty good hitters. So, I think it's working out, so I'm definitely happy. Uh, I'm missing a little more bats, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's it's three outs before run is really the name of the game. Do you think the development of your off-speed stuff is probably what's going to be the determining factor in you missing more bats? Because, like you said, against lefties especially, that sinker's not going to play as well, like in on the hands the way that it does against righties. Do you think that the off-speed stuff is kind of what's the the uh, a magic elixir, so to speak? Yeah, uh, that was something we had worked on a lot in spring, and that was like the focal point of my my preseason meeting. Um, to right-handed hitters, I'm I'm pretty much going to stick sinkers and sliders um, until I see a reason to not. Um, as far as lefties, I started adding in uh, four seamers at the top, and then trying to mix in sliders and changeups as well. Um, just be just to get them off a of sinker. I mean, again, like you said, sinkers kind of kind of run into their bat, bat path a bit more than a right-handed hitter. So they, they square it up a little bit more. But I think the more I can mix up all four pitches relatively, um, have a decent mix of all four of those pitches and, and elevate the four seam at the top to give them a little bit of an eye change, I, I think the more it'll help. Do you ever go back and watch your stuff and, and realize how nasty it is? Um, I, occasionally. I, I try not to go back and watch stuff. I don't know why. Um, Although I did make pitching ninja for the first time in my career this this you know a couple of weeks back in Chicago, so I did see that one. Yeah. Um, I will go back from time to time, but for the most part, I try to keep it present and just focus on the next outing. For sure. I mean, I, I'm a pitching guy, and it, like yeah, I peep pitching ninja at all the time. So I, I knew that the ones obviously in Chicago, and then the one that you threw to get Marte in in New York. I'm like that. That'll I'll be seen. I've watched that about 200 times. But uh, you know, we've talked to AJ. We've had him on the program before, and one thing that I love about the way that AJ manages his pen, unlike really any other manager that we've ever had here, is he's really big on fluid bullpen rolls that, you know, just because a guy is the closer, so to speak, doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to get the final three outs. You're going to, the best guy's probably going to get the highest leverage, whether it's seventh inning, eighth inning, ninth inning. Uh, and we I talked about it a little bit earlier, but do you, do you enjoy always having to be prepared to, to come into a game or do you like having the structure that comes with being, Hey, you're the seventh inning guy. You're the eighth inning guy. You're the closer, so to speak. No, I think, um, I, I think I kind of like the way he does it as well. I mean, it's easier to, it's easier to have a set role. If, again, if you have like an Edwin Diaz where he's just, right. no matter who's up, he's just going to mow him down pretty much regardless. Um, I think this year, again, we have, I think the bullpen is one of our, our strong suits, yeah. um, as it's been the last couple seasons. Um, I think it's somehow only gotten better, uh, you know, with the additions of Shelby and, and Chafin back, and then Joey and, uh, and Fiedo back in like a, a little bit of a longer, a longer relief role. And I really think we have eight tremendous options down there. So I think, sorry about that. Uh, I think AJ's done a, a pretty good job of of kind of putting us in favorable matchups. Whereas like there is a pocket of guys that are probably going to throw in the winning formula, and I think he does a good job of matching us up because we're all so different, right? Like I. I sink the ball well. Lang throws wipeout curveballs. Shelby throws four seamers that no one can square up, and then Chafin throws demon sliders. And so I think we all have some some different tools that can get different hitters out. And he does a good job of get, giving us a favorable matchup. That, that's a really good point that you bring up. Is that like you know bullpens are bullpens. You want guys who get outs, but I feel like there's like this Swiss Army knife element to the different pitchers in this pen. Like Holton stuff does not compare to what Shelby Mil Miller is going to feature and Chafin oh. stuff is not going to compare to what Lang is going to feature. So there's not, it's not like you're just 
putting out three different guys that are all going to throw 100. There's kind of a variance that I feel like makes this bullpen really difficult to uh, to deal with. But, you know, it, you've gotten some opportunities. You've, you've locked down some saves already this year, and I've heard – Many times, and I got into this argument with people many years ago as the Tigers had their bullpen struggles, which is ironic now that the bullpen's as good as it is. But, you know, they said the final three outs are, are the hardest to get. Do you feel that way, or do you feel like that's that's more of a matter? Um, I don't know, man. I'll tell you what. The big leagues is hard. I, I think any three outs is pretty challenging to get. But um, I guess there is a little bit more of like a – Maybe there's a touch more pressure in the ninth inning, but I don't know, man. I, I think sometimes you come in, the dude that throws the seventh against, you know, the heart of the order, you know, might be a, an easier job or then if you happen to throw the ninth against maybe the bottom of the order or if you got to come in the sixth. I mean, there's plenty of times where, you know, the starter comes out in a jam in the sixth and, like, uh, whomever comes in and has to get out of a second and third jam. And, and that might be the hardest uh, reliever – uh, job for that for that game so I really think all all the roles are pretty challenging and all all outs are tough to get but um I guess there was a little bit more of a mental block you could say in the ninth inning but yeah it, re it really depends on the pitcher it seems I feel like some guys slip into that role really easily some guys struggle there's been and I've talked about it on this show before there's been a lot of discussion about kind of the pitching lab that's being developed in Detroit with Chris Fetter and Robin Lund and Juan Nieves and kind of what they've done uh, for the organization to help these guys along. What have they done specifically for you that you feel like has made you a much better pitcher? Uh, I, I think as a unit, they do a great job of kind of letting you be you and, and attacking your strengths and like honing in on your, your strengths rather than trying to make you a different pitcher. Um, again, cause like I said, we're all, we're all pretty different down there. Everyone, everyone features different stuff. I mean, everyone gets to the big leagues with, with different stuff and, and a different style of pitching. And I think they do a good job of just honing in on that and maybe making tweaks and not really trying to overhaul your delivery or overhaul your stuff. Um, but they all do. They're, they're great. I think as a unit too, because, because Robin's so fantastic with like the biomechanics and how the body moves and the delivery. And, and Juan is such a good wealth of knowledge from like an old school baseball perspective and he uses his eyes so well. And, He'll pick up on little nuances of swings and tendencies and, and whatnot. And then Fed is really good with, like, the analytics and the data. And so I think the combo of them offer, like, a pretty good approach to pitching. And it's I think it's showing it's working out. Does that inspire confidence in you, knowing that you have kind of that, that support system, that backing that knows what they're doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you uh, it's always nice to have people back there that know what they're doing. And then I, I think sometimes, too, it's – you know, pitching and baseball are so analytically driven now, and I think sometimes it's just like Juan, I think, especially – we deal with Juan quite quite often just because he's our bullpen coach and we're down there with him the whole game. But I think sometimes all it takes is just a little bit of confidence, right? I don't – like sometimes I don't think you need to overhaul so much stuff and like, oh, your arm position is this and, you're, and you're, you're, your hips are here and your release is that. And like sometimes he'll just – you'll throw a pitch and he'll just be like hyping you up and like, damn, that's nasty and damn, that's gross. Like, blah, blah. And sometimes I think that's all you need. And then I think, especially when you're going in the game and warming up in a big spot, he keeps it pretty light down there and, and, he, and he instills some good confidence in you. I've always been curious about that with analytics. And I've asked different guys about it and they've kind of given me different answers. But with you, does there come a point where it can be too much, where you're thinking too much on the mound uh, after with all the data that you're given and maybe you're not just out there throwing the way that you should? Yeah, I would say I probably err on the side of less analytics um, than, than some guys. Um, there's some guys that have the ability to look at that stuff and, and take what they need and adjust. I feel like I'll, I'll dive too deep in a rabbit hole and, and lose sight of what's really important. Like, I'm kind of a guy that I'm just going to go out there and try to attack the zone with my best stuff and pitch to my strengths. And I'd rather go down on my strengths and than, like, try to pitch to a zone or pitch to a, a weakness or, or worry about whether my stuff is breaking the correct way. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, if you're, if your slider is a, a few horizontal inches off than it normally is like, is that what you're going to be sweating about in the eighth inning with a man on base? Like, yeah. no, you're going to have to execute a pitch and, and grow some balls and figure out a way to get them out. So, um, I'm kind of a fan of if I, if I have a good outing and I, you know, I, I don't give up a run or, or I do my job, like, I don't really worry about it unless unless there's something blatantly wrong that the coaches want to come and get me with. But 
I'll let the results of the game kind of dictate whether or not I'll, I'll look at the analytics. For sure. Yeah, it's it's fascinating talking to these guys about it because I, I some of them dive headfirst into it. And some of them, I think that when, you know, when you have the stuff that you have, it's, you know, it's probably easier to, uh, you know, not, not to ignore it necessarily. I'm sure you're paying attention to it, but not dive as deep into it because, you know, like you said, you can, over, like I said, you can overthink. Uh, you know, one thing that has been sadly kind of the story of the baseball season so far has been the number of arm and elbow injuries that pitchers have had to deal with. I mean, it feels like every every day, you know, we're hearing about another pitcher uh, having to get Tommy John. I mean, it's kind of becoming an epidemic uh, throughout baseball. As someone who's gone through the Tommy John process and as somebody who is, you know, a high thrower with a you know, high spin rate in that sinker, um, I mean, do you, do you have concern about uh, for yourself or is that something that you just can't afford to think about throughout the season? Yeah, I don't, I don't think as a pitcher, like, you can afford to be thinking about that stuff. I mean, you don't ever want to be just like, can you know, you don't want to be just contemplating, oh, will I get hurt? Throughout the, you know what I mean? You just kind of throw and do your best to, to keep to keep your body healthy in the training room and the weight room and whatnot. Um, it is unfortunate that Tommy John seemed to have gone up. Um, but, again, like, the, the average velocity, I mean, people are throwing the shit out of it now, like, feels like everyone that comes up is throwing 100 or every starters are sitting like 95 now. I mean, it's it's a joke, but I think that's probably a major um, in, influence of it. And I saw I saw a video of Verlander talking about it the other yeah. day. It, it kind of makes sense. He's like, you know, what's a kid going to do? He's like on the brink of making the big leagues. And what is he going to like back off his 100 mile an hour fastball just to like feel – a little bit healthier like nah you, as a competitor you're gonna go out there and throw your throw your best stuff and try to get try to get outs because you know that eventually is going to dictate how successful you are in your career so it is unfortunate but it, and yeah again it is unfortunate to see a lot of a lot of big name pitchers and kind of go down this year yeah and that's uh, that's an incredible point that you make or that verlander made about these guys coming up because they're i mean making the big leagues is tough and and, and the idea of like you know Take, knocking it down a peg just so, you know, to kind of preserve your arm. I mean, we, it's been proven time and again, teams and organizations are going to be willing to potentially put up with that stuff for the sake of the kind of stuff that these guys are featuring. I mean, I feel like Strasburg was the like original example of that not too long ago and he was throwing 102 in San Diego yep. State. And they're like, yeah, we know, we know the potential for injury is there, but we also know what this guy can be at his peak. And that's somebody who's shutting down, you know, lineups consistently. Now he was able to find it, but he ultimately got, uh, you know, Tommy John as well. Uh, a couple more questions here for you. I was, I was doing a deep dive into some stuff that you were featured in on, on Valley. It seemed like you had, you had a pretty fun time in Seattle last year. What was a, what was a weirder experience? The, uh, the gum wall or catching fish at Pike place fish market? Uh, I gotta think that, I mean, the, the gum wall is disgusting. I mean, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't really understand the infatuation there, but um, catching it's, the fish is pretty It's neat. art to somebody, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, it was legitimately just, I mean, disgusting how much pieces of gum were over there. I don't know who started that or how, but I guess you got some weird people over there in the, in the Northwest. But catching the fish was pretty cool. I thought it was going to be a lot. I truly thought it was just going to slip right through my right right through my hands, but uh, the guy gave me a good feed, and, and I stuck it. So one, one wreck for me, for fantasy owners. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, Last question for you, and this is one that I, I'm always curious in asking people, but especially with somebody who's had the kind of journey th that you've had. You know, if you could in the in the modern age talk to the Jason Foley that was undrafted in 2016 and tell him one thing, what's the one piece of advice that you'd give him? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I would probably say something along the lines of. You know, don't, it sounds cliche, I guess, but just don't, uh, don't ever give up. And like the more you, the more disciplined you are and the harder you work, I think you really can have a lot more success than you believe you can have um, through just continuing to grind, not giving up and working hard. And I think that's something that could really apply to any industry and any kid out there with whatever they're going for. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's something that I think I had to learn the hard way through Tommy John. I don't think I was like the hardest working kid prior to that. I don't think I was the most disciplined kid prior to that, but I think Tommy John was kind of kicking a little bit of a kick in the balls for me and a, and a little bit of an eye opening realization that 
you know, you're going to have to put a lot more effort into this if you want the results that you ultimately want. So kind of just, yeah, keep, keep grinding, keep, keep your head down keep grinding and, and, and don't give up and good things are generally going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, that stuff is cliche because it works. Like there's truth to that, like yeah. you know, of, uh, to that principle of like continuing to grind along and making sure that, you know, you're doing the best you can every day. I mean, look, man, you, I, I mean this genuinely, you're a fun guy to watch pitch. I, I you know, I, I love seeing you go to work, you throw strikes. I love that sinker. Uh, and really this bullpen in general, this first 11 games has been, it's been awesome. And especially cause we, <laughs> as a tiger fan who grew up in an age where we had some great teams and some not so great pens, uh, you know, not having a coronary every eighth and ninth inning is is a wonderful, wonderful experience to have. So, dude, keep doing what you're doing. It's an amazing story, what you've been through. And, uh, you know, we're rooting for you guys all the way. And uh, I, I appreciate you joining the show today, man. I really do. No doubt. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Of course. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Thanks so much to Jason for coming on the show. I, I, I knew he'd be a good interview. Uh, I've seen him be interviewed before. I saw him be interviewed by Natalie Kerwin. I've seen him uh, on Bally. Just a laid back, good dude. Uh, though not, not, not laid back in the mound. I mean, and not really laid back when he's pumping 101 mile per hour sinkers past your face. Uh, maybe probably not the easiest guy to go up against, but uh, like I said earlier, easy guy to root for. And, and and that's just one thing I've noticed. Look, I think that with this Tigers team being a young team, uh, you, you have so many guys who haven't corrupted might be too strong a word, but haven't been influenced by marketing and free agency and had the big bucks thrown their way. You know, these are guys that were humbled. They came up through the system. You look at somebody like Foley. We talked about it openly. This is a guy who wasn't drafted when the draft was 40 rounds. And now uh, he's, he's uh, pitching games for the Tigers, even closing games for the Tigers. So uh, I, a lot of these guys, every one of them that I've uh, interviewed, whether they were guys who were coming up through the minor leagues, like Justin Henry Malloy or guys who have made it at the big league, big league level, like Tarek school. I've been impressed by all of them. And, and with Scott Harris being a, a disciple of Theo Epstein. I know one of Theo Epstein's big principles was that everyone has access to analytics nowadays. Everyone has access to data, which means that the kind of uh, the kind of magic elixir is that you can look at the mental makeup of a player. You want, and, and Theo Epstein has been open about this, you want the best people in your organization to also be the best players. And, I, and it seems to me, just based on the, the subjects that I've interviewed, for this show that Scott Harris is continuing that philosophy that Theo Epstein carried uh, with him to Chicago. So really fun episode. I appreciate Jason uh, joining the program. One more little tidbit uh, for people who are watching this or listening to this, this Saturday, if you're watching this on YouTube, this photo behind me, me, that's me and Dan hasty calling a West Michigan white caps game two summers ago. That was summer 2022. I will be joining him again this Saturday for a day game in West Michigan. I'll still get all my Tigers coverage out. Y'all don't have to worry about that. I don't take days off, but I will be joining Dan and doing color commentary from West Michigan Whitecaps game link to where you can find that. I will post it all on social media. I don't have access to that stuff yet, but Dan's always very good with uh, helping me out. Dan will be on this program at, at some point in the future as well. If he wants to be, I don't, I don't want to hold the poor guy hostage, but he's always done a wonderful job. Always been very supportive. Really looking forward to that so that will do it for today's show like i said you can hit this like button hit the subscribe button hit that bell so you are notified every single time that i upload uh, an episode of chris and company and if you want to listen to this in audio format go to apple Podcasts, go to spotify go to google play there you'll find everything chris and company related if you want to listen to this in your car on your way to work listen to it while you're working out listen to it while you're making love with your wife I, <laughs> you can do that as well I, I don't know why that might be a little creepy but uh thank you guys so much for the continued support really um you know, I, I've been open and I'm always open that this has been kind of a crazy time, but I, I feel good about content wise where we're at. You know, I, I think that we've got the hard part down and me and Austin do, which is that we're making stuff that people enjoy. And I appreciated all the people at the ballpark last week who weren't just talking tigers, but, but complimenting us on Chris and company, uh, which is something, you know, I love doing interviews. It's one of my favorite things I've had the opportunity to do. And even before I left Barstool, this was a venture that I wanted to continue and uh, hopefully it'll grow. So thank you very much to everyone who continues to watch and support and listen, keep that support up. It really means uh, the world to me and Austin. Thank you very much, everybody. We will be back here next week with another interview. Have a great rest of your day. Peace and happiness. Mm -hmm.